Hello, I'm Holly Lynn Lee from North Carolina State University, and I'm here with our expert panel, and I'm going to give them a chance to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about what they've been doing in statistics education. I'm Roger Woodard. I'm from the Department of Statistics at North Carolina State University. Uh, I coordinate our large intro course and also uh, deal with a lot of other statistics teaching related uh, types of things uh, and have been doing that for about 14 years now. Yeah, yeah, we've been at NC State together for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm Christine Franklin. Uh, I'm actually recently retired from the University of Georgia, the Department of Statistics, after 36 years. And I've been involved in statistics education most of my career, uh, in particular K through 12, I'd say for the past 20 years. And I'm currently uh, working as the K through 12 statistical ambassador for the American Statistical Association. Yeah. All right. And hi, I'm Mary Ann Huey. I'm with Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. And I've been in statistics ed, I guess, 10 years. I just added that up quickly. <laughs> and. Uh, over the last four years, I've been working with our high school and middle school teachers in Iowa, helping them to prepare to teach um, statistics and probability content that aligns with the Common Core State Standards and GAZE recommendations, so both of those. Yeah, great, great. Well, I've got a couple questions that I'm going to ask our expert panel today. And um, the focus of our um, conversation this afternoon is going to be on inferential reasoning. So how would you describe inferential reasoning? We want to take a stab at going first on that? I guess uh, I'll take a shot at it. Uh, one of the things I think about when I think about inferential reasoning is the process of infinite inference uh, to begin with mm -hmm. and uh, really understanding kind of what's going into that. So the idea that you understand that the statistic you get from a sample is going to vary from the population values and that you have to understand that variability if you want to uh, make a generalization from something in a sample to mm -hmm. something in a, in a, a population mm -hmm. or from an experiment to the population in general. Okay. All right. Anything you'd like to add to that? I think Roger said it well. I, I know for myself in working with teachers and with students, I think their natural inclination is when working with data, they just want to come up with one number that they use to describe the population and, and for me just helping students to realize that maybe either informally or formally they need to take into account variability and move from descriptive statistics, descriptive models to more inferential thinking. I have teachers ask me a lot what inference is and usually they're mathematics teachers who haven't thought about statistics. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think the big new idea for them is that we take samples of data and try to say something about a wider population or all the data that we probably can't collect. Um, but we never know for sure if that's the right statement. There's always some level of uncertainty and that's that's new for them. That's a kind of a challenge for yeah. students and teachers. So. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, thinking some about the um, statements that you all said, I hear that it involves data. So mm -hmm. we're reasoning from data, but we're trying to generalize beyond that data, trying to make a statement beyond that data, and that there's uncertainty involved, and that, the, and that the claims that we make, we recognize that there's a level of uncertainty in the claims that we're making. So, good, 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 good. So, why is it important for our students to kind of engage in inference? Why should this be part of any curriculum that we do? Hmm. That's what our world's about now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. our, our, our world is about being surrounded by data and trying to use data to make informed decisions. And uh, it's just really critical that it becomes just sort of second nature to them that when they're working with data, they think about this uncertainty, this variability right. component, which you can't just use descriptive statistics. You've got to be able to bring in that component when you're making generalizations. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of generalizations going on in our world right now. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to build up what you were saying, um, that a lot of times students, um, their idea of the world, the perception of the world, are their own experiences, right? And so yeah. we, we develop as humans heuristics that don't help us um, necessarily make good judgments and decisions. And so uh, we have a lot of data, but as everyday citizens, we may or may not use that data um, we use our own experiences mm -hmm. to kind of generate, unfortunately, biases. And so students need, early on, experiences with data 
that they can reason from to kind of challenge some of those heuristics before they really get set in and yeah, biases right. get set in. So it's, it's critical that it starts early, you know, sixth grade um, students should be looking at data that is relevant to them so that they can start right. thinking differently in different ways. Yeah. Because if you see your neighbor get in a car accident, now you have one case and they're gonna extrapolate, mm -hmm. it's just one case. But that's right. kind of their world. Um, so that's that's why I think it's important. Yeah, so I like how you were talking about early on. So what about the college level? Yeah, that's one of the things at the university level, uh, even though students have seen data at, you know, in the, in the K-12 environment and have been doing this since they were in fifth or sixth grade. Hopefully. They, yeah, <laughs> uh, they still don't fully grasp the idea of the variability of those mm -hmm. those summaries that they're looking at. You know, mm -hmm. they're getting these sample statistics and they don't really, you know, uh, internalize the idea that yes, this is a value that could be very different if you were to have taken a different sample or conduct the experiment again. Right, right. So experiences with repeated sampling right. might give them some a better understanding about exactly. this presence of variability. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I think is really important about teaching that is to let them see that repeated sampling and the variability that comes from that. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. So we know that um, any good statistical investigation starts with a good question. Right? So what kinds of questions can we pose if we were posing um, questions to our students that would engage them in opportunities to um, make claims from data and to engage in inferential reasoning? What are some of the types of questions we might ask them? Okay, I yeah. can start. So for, for middle school and high school um, students, I would say that if you can have data that they actually collect themselves, mm -hmm. it's very powerful. So if you can have students um, doing some kind of activity and collecting data that they, they are generating, then they will understand where that data came from, they will understand the limitations, and it will really allow them to reason um, in a more robust way. Um, other other types of questions though could be uh, just about things that are relevant to them. So uh, one activity was we had was comparing Pixar's Pixar's to DreamWorks, uh, like which movie company is better or more popular, and they all know about Pixar's and DreamWorks, and um, so it was a good context for them to reason from. Uh, so I think that's important. Sometimes teachers uh, will will create questions that students are really not interested in, like. Um, does sleeping more hours mean you uh, have higher grades, right? So we'd be careful of those teacher questions that they want to maybe show some relationship. Because um, sometimes there's not a relationship. Yeah, or, or they'll work hard <laughs> to make sure it doesn't pan out, right? right? The students will kind of work against you sometimes. And the old like height versus foot length, I mean, some of those activities uh, students have seen again and again and again. Mm -hmm. So we need to be, I think we need to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. So engaging contexts that, yeah, kid, exactly. that, yeah. that kids really care about so that they want to be uh -huh. able to make a claim. Yeah, right. 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 Yeah, and that they understand, it, one of the things you talked about was that they understand the sources of variability. Mm -hmm. You know, they're looking mm -hmm. at that context and they know what's going on and they can look at it and say, yeah. oh, part of what's happening there is the way you're measuring this mm -hmm. or part of what's happening there is you know, the way that you've got one person doing this and the other person's doing that, so they can see those sources of variability hands on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think often if you can find examples that are connected to social media, for like Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, cell phone usage, these are all topics that they're very interested in. Right. Sports, things of this sort, but you got to make it, you really do have to make it real world yeah. for their age, mm -hmm. right? the time they yeah. are. Yeah. Right. So that they understand it they and so that they that understand they say, what's going on. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I really like how you guys are talking about um, not just the kind of questions we might ask them, but we're getting into this area of like what makes a good task mm -hmm. to get them engaged in. And so I want to dig a little deeper into that about the kinds of like features of a good task that students um, really have this opportunity to, to make inferences with. What else besides the kind of an engaging context do we need to be putting into those tasks? I think you know, one of the things that you want to help students understand initially is how difficult it is to actually collect data. Uh -huh. And that you, know, you, you need to formulate questions, you, you need to have precision about the questions that you're formulating. And you know, once you formulate those questions that ne necessitate collecting data, 
that it's not always an easy task to get the data that you need right. to answer your question. So I think the process of formulating their questions and then thinking about how to collect that data to answer that question is a very powerful piece. Mm -hmm. What students typically want to say, well, let's just go gather some data here and let's analyze it and then let's make a conclusion. But it's that upfront piece that I think we need to put more emphasis on. Yeah, yeah. And I think related to that, that collecting data piece is that if there's an issue that they're concerned about, maybe about social media mm -hmm. use, that they have to think about perhaps what other fa what factors might impact someone's mm -hmm. social media use. And so I have to collect data about those things mm -hmm. so that I end up with a data set that has more than one variable. The question isn't just how often do you use Facebook? You know, yeah. or do you know, how many social media accounts do you use? It might matter if you're what gender you are. It might matter your age. It well, might matter. Multivariate thinking. Exactly. So it's it's trying to promote this multivariate thinking, and so we have to get them to think about collecting data that's multivariate in right. in nature. Well, I think they initially have to think about what population they're they're clear mm -hmm. they yeah. clearly yeah. define right. the population that they're wanting to try to make conclusions or information. Absolutely, about. and collect the data and from that that's population. Exactly right. <laughs> so right. there's there's a lot of that up front that I just don't think we spend enough time on mm -hmm. with the students to think about. Yeah, yeah. And I think also one of the characteristics of tasks that I kind of think about is that um, there needs to be some kind of um, reason for them to make an inference. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's some context that's real or real to them about, you know, why do we care about, you know, the popularity about Pixar and DreamWorks or what, you know, the example that I heard earlier today about um, trash and recycling, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a social cause, social cause, you know, there's an environmental cause about being able to kind of infer something about whether you recycle or not and, um, mm -hmm. and being able to make claims that can help, uh, you know, further some cause. I think one of my favorite examples from the elementary level is, you know, when I would go into my son's schools and I'd say these, see these beautiful posters on the school walls where data had been collected about the favorite mm -hmm. shoes, your favorite type of shoes to wear, these beautiful pictographs or these bar graphs, and then I would ask the teachers, well, what was your motivation for collecting this data? And it was, well, um, we needed to meet a certain standard. <laughs> you know, about creating bar graphs, yeah. pie charts. And I think that was really what helped me begin to think years ago, we need to help bring up this upfront piece. So I would say, well, why not mo motivate the reason the students are collecting this data? You have a shoe store down the road where the owner can only keep a certain amount of stock mm -hmm. of shoes in the store, and he needs to know what's most popular now among first and second graders in the school. So right. let's help out by right. collecting some right. some data. Let's conduct a survey. Yeah. And so I, I think it's just a simple matter of, you know, helping that understanding that there has to be a motivating reason yeah. for why. Right. And I think the students would really enjoy that. They're helping out the local shoe store out That's there. right. That's right. I was actually in my son's second grade classroom right. and um, I gave them a context. We, we, we read a, a book and then for the data that I wanted them to collect, it was about planning the class party mm -hmm. and the kinds of snacks that mm -hmm. we wanted to have at the class party and we wanted to find out about what kinds of what kind of snacks do the kids really like? So we made sure that there was stuff at the party that they wanted, and of course, then we got to plan the party from the data that we collected. And that's really and that was very motivating to them. <laughs> very motivating. That's right. Yeah, and but you know, you bring up a good point there. There's also the follow-up. You guys were talking about the lead-in, right? But a good task also needs to make sure that yes. you, you know, you have the lead-in, then you maybe you calculate or create a graphic or whatever. But then you also have to make sure that you make that conclusion and right. that you understand the implications where, where that's that. going with that. Right. And that you connect it back to your original question. That's right. Exactly. So the interpretation and the connecting back right. of, well, what does the my data actually mean and how do I interpret that with the context? Right. So many people think of statistics as the calculations, but it's the right. tiny little piece in the middle and all the big stuff is on each side of that. That's right. That's right. So that, supporting that, your that's claim. That's what I was going to say about the the good task is not just a bunch of calculations right. and a chart at the end, but I think a lot of a lot of activities that you might see in a textbook are mostly calculations or generating a representation and there's very little no representation <laughs> at the at the end that connects back to a question. Sometimes you're missing the whole question mm -hmm. piece, right? Yeah. So yeah. 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 Well that's good. Well I think that uh, we should be able to talk about some new some interesting tasks here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>